Welcome to Disaffected. I'm Joshua Slocum, and this is the show where we talk about politics, culture, and relationships through a psychological lens from dystopian Burlington, Vermont. Are the people who are concerned with illegal immigration truly racists? Is it actually true that white Westerners are intrinsically oppressive and rapacious? That is, are we just born that way? Do we actually believe that people who don't want cross-dressing men who wear diapers to teach their school children, do we really believe that those people who object to this are putting those men's lives in danger? Is it really true that anyone who is referred to as a person of color is born a morally perfect saint who is always oppressed in every situation and is never wrong or imperfect in any way, no matter what? It's extraordinary that I'm asking these questions seriously instead of as part of a comedy routine, but extraordinary is now normal. And the events of this past week in Israel might be morally clarifying. Progressive leftists are reacting in emotional ways to the gruesome atrocities perpetrated this week by Hamas. Some of them reflexively jumped to support them, revealing a psychopathically inclined segment of that population. Others realized that they had glibly signed on to something that sounded like it fit their values, but it didn't. Still others on the left are confessing that they're not only shocked by what Hamas did, but horrified to see the reaction of many of their fellow leftists. I've seen several self-described normal liberals this week say they're questioning everything, what they thought was true, who they thought was a moral exemplar, and what they think today after seeing those comrades support rape and murder of civilians. Have we reached a point where enough leftists are feeling it personally that we might be able to talk to each other again? Might it be possible to come together, even temporarily, even at arm's length, to push back on evil together? Could this be the beginning of our ability to talk to each other again across the aisle like sane people in America or in the West? And now we have to talk about the thing I don't want to talk about, the segment that we have to do and I don't want to do about Israel. As you know, on October 7th, Hamas, the terrorist group in Palestine, launched rockets over the border into Israel. As you also know, Hamas terrorists paraglided over the border and into a music festival full of young people. They shot hundreds of them, murdered them, on camera, in cold blood. Then some of the terrorists raped women next to the dead bodies of their friends. And they did it on camera, and they uploaded that footage with glee. Old women, children, and babies have been murdered for the benefit of the cameras, sometimes while their families were forced to watch. We won't be showing you any of those videos. If you want to see them, you already have. It's beyond what I can tolerate emotionally. But this is psychopathy. This is sadistic psychopathy, the worst kind, the kind that takes affirmative pleasure in the suffering of other people. Everyone can see it, including the people who like it. And there are a surprising, there's a surprising number of people in a surprising number of places who like it very much indeed. Here are some of them. This is from a, it's very short, but it's from one of many pro-Palestinian gatherings in the United Kingdom. Are you people tired? Are you on the same? Are you people tired? Yes. Oh, good. Good. Are they tired? Oh, good. For those of you listening, not able to see this, it's a bunch of young white people and they're saying, are your people dead? Aw, good. Are they dead? Aw, good. Filthy chabs, British white trash. That's sadism. It's joy in seeing death and horror suffered by others. It's the next step in what our friend Karen in Seattle would take. Remember her from last week and from the week before? Mocking the reporter for being bothered by seeing open you, drug use on the streets. Oh, were you in a car? Were they bothering you? Were they bothering you a lot? Oh, 
good. Here's the Harvard Students Palestine Solidarity Group Statement. Joint Statement by Harvard Palestine Solidarity Groups on the Situation in Palestine. We, the undersigned student organizations, hold the Israeli regime entirely responsible for all unfolding violence. Today's events did not occur in a vacuum. For the last two decades, millions of Palestinians in Gaza have been forced to live in an open-air prison. Israeli officials promised to, quote, open the gates of hell. And the massacres in Gaza have already commenced. Palestinians in Gaza have no shelters for refuge and nowhere to escape. In the coming days, Palestinians will be forced to bear the full brunt of Israel's violence. That came out the day of, or the day after, the Hamas films showing the rape of young women next to the corpses of their friends. That came out the day of, or the day after, video of old women at bus stops being murdered in cold blood by laughing Palestinian Hamas terrorists. Israel is responsible for all those rapes and all that sadism. You see? Here's an example from one of many so-called queer groups. This is what we would have called 20 years ago lesbian, gay stuff, but it's not now. It's queer. We're going to talk more about queer. It's one of many who believe that the Hamas psychopaths are the good guys who love freedom and self-expression. Queers for Palestine, queer action collective, they say behind their banner. Before you say, this is what dumb college kids do, overly passionate college kids, stop yourself and ask a few questions. Before the past seven years, do you remember college kids routinely backing psychopaths who rape women and murder babies? Ask yourself another question. Think, think about the gay friends that you knew in college or the leftist protest type friends that you knew in college. Maybe you were one of those people. Think about them. Do you remember those college kids supporting psychopaths who would and who do execute gays in their countries? Do you remember your friends who were gay in college supporting regimes who do, we see it, it's on camera, they do execute people in public for homosexuality? Is that part of your memory? It's not part of mine. These are not normal college kids. These are not just, well, every generation's like that. No, they're not. Why do you think that? If you think that, and some people still do, why? This is different. It's corrupt. It's not the same as it always was. And here are some young gay men who are so disconnected from the real world that they are likely to get themselves killed. This is a couple of, uh, just a small sample. Twitter this week has been hell on earth. I've seen things and thoughts from people that I did not want to see. I learned things about people that I did not want to know. Now I know them and I have to live with it. And I'll be making some decisions. This is from somebody named Spencer Hillman. He says, A, I have Palestinian LGBTQ friends. I've been to gay clubs in the Middle East. There's a great deal of homophobia, but it's not, quote, you wouldn't survive level in many places, including Palestine. His interlocutor, interlocutor a young man named Alex Severin, said, exactly. LGBT people are much safer in Gaza than in Florida or Texas, for instance. <clears throat> you get it, right? You see the disconnection from reality? Please tell me you see it. Now, here's a moment from a pro-Hamas gathering in an auditorium in the largely Arab Dearborn, 
Michigan. Notice as you watch this that these are not college kids. These are fully grown adults. The speaker is well into middle age. This is not complicated. When you go to a Black Lives Matter rally, you see Palestinian flags. When you go to a white supremacy rally, you see Israeli flags. This is not complicated. When Zionists march down the street, they say death to Arabs. When we march down the street, we say free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. This is not difficult, everybody. There's something about that cadence that drives me up the wall. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Something chilling about it. White supremacy rallies. When was the last time you saw a white supremacy rally in the United States? Be honest. That's right. Oh, is that one time in Charlottesville? Yeah. Now go on with the lie about Trump saying that there were very good people on the Nazi side too. Let's, let's recapitulate and rehearse that whole thing again, shall we? Or can we not do that? Are we past that now? We should be. Are we in the real world now, this week? Does Trump look so bad to you now? I'm trying really hard to control my temper this week. It's not working fully. And uh, what of the sacred peoples of the Americas, the blacks? Well, Black Lives Matter Chicago chapter says this. Here is their, well, it's a tweet. It was on all their social media. It is a picture of a paraglider, a silhouette of a paraglider with a Palestinian flag with the legend, I stand with Palestine. Surprising. Shocking. How could the world's most oppressed and most empathetic people, American blacks, how could they side with rapist barbarians? No, not all blacks, of course. I'll give you the not alls on this one. BLM. This is not representative of black people as black people. In fact, there are quite a few black viewers and listeners of this show who are far more than me beyond sick of this shit. So why would they side with the rapist barbarians? They must have just been having a moment, right? Just a moment. Well, BLM Los Angeles was also having that moment. Here is their statement. We too understand what it means to be surveilled, dehumanized, property seized, families separated, our people criminalized and slaughtered with impunity, locked up in droves, what we... I'm, I'm breaking in. No, no, you don't know that. No, you don't know that. That never happened to you. Black Lives Matter, blacks in America. Stop lying. Stop it. How dare you? This is what's going on in the Middle East right now is real violence. The real, actual, observable kind that's happening in the tangible, physical world. S shut up. Shut up. I'll try again. We too understand what it means to be surveilled, dehumanized, property seized, families separated, our people criminalized and slaughtered with impunity, locked up in droves, and when we resist, they call us terrorists. We too dream of a world where our people may live freely on decolonized land. <laughs> May the borders, checkpoints, prisons, police, and watch lists that terrorize our communities crumble, and may the world we build from their ashes honor those who have fallen in struggle. Disgusting. Pigs. Shocking and surprising, isn't it? Or is it? Might we have known that they would go there? Was there a clue if we were paying attention? Well, here is former Black Lives Matter head Patrice Cullors back in 2015. That's a full eight years ago. Eight years ago. Take a listen to what she has to say. The other thing I'll say is Palestine is our generation in South Africa. And if... 
if if we don't step up uh, boldly and courageously to end the the imperialist project that's called Israel, um, we're doomed. And I think that I, I had learned about Palestine for a long time. I had known about it, been wanting to travel, and I was really, really grateful when the Dream Defenders um, asked me to come on the delegation. Uh, but nothing would have prepared me for the level of milit militarization and the, uh, and the level of violence that we would witness those 10 days inside of Palestine. Um, nothing would have prepared me for uh, the ways in which um, we witness people's terror. Uh, people live in terror on a daily basis. And um, nothing would have prepared me for how much clarity I would have on on why we have to be a part of um, uh, Palestinian solidarity. <clears throat> Patrice Collars is, of course, famous for buying millions of dollars in real estate for herself as part of the reparations that she felt she was due out of the donations to Black Lives Matter. You stupid white people who donated got exactly what you deserved. You got played, and I'm glad. How do you like it? Hamas is psychopathic. If the U.S. can be described as having a culture, a culture-wide case of borderline personality disorder, then Palestine can be described, not Palestine, Hamas, Hamas is Palestine, can be described as having a culture-wide case of psychopathy, sadistic psychopathy, fully devoid of any empathy, any human sympathy, and full of sadism with an erotic gratification achieved through degradation, rape, and murder. Hamas has said many times this week some formulation of, if Israel does X, if Israel takes this step, if Israel retaliates, then we will be, quote, forced to execute a hostage. Maybe the five-year-old hostage they took. Maybe he can pay for it. Because he's just a Jewish, dirty little boy, isn't he? That's don't make me hit you. Why are you making me hit you? Except it's worse. Why are you making me kill you? Why are you, why are you making me force you to watch me execute your child? That's the abusive parent when the abusive parent busts out of the home and goes society-wide. And what of the progressive liberals? What of the queers? Is this metaphor... In this metaphor, they are the borderlines and the histrionics who are always the best standing army of foot soldiers for any psychopathic leader. Queer isn't a sexuality or an identity. It's a political stance that means I am against anything normal. Whatever it is that society says is normal, regardless of the quality and content of that normal, if it is seen as normal, I, a queer, am against it. That is what queer means. The issue isn't the issue. Being against a thing is what they want. That's all it is. Anything that's normal, anything that's the system must, by definition, be oppressive and wrong. Therefore, being against that thing must, by definition, be the morally right and liberating course of action, even if it means you get killed. This is how psychopaths ensnare borderlines. If we're going to extend this metaphor, you, they get them to believe hysterically in an alleged victim who doesn't actually exist and isn't being victimized so that they can get the hysterics to support the psychopath's crimes. That's how they do it in the home. That's how they do it in the workplace. That's how they do it in romantic relationships. That's how they do it when a psychopath or another kind of cluster B asshole starts a smear campaign against a competitor. This is what they do. You often see these groupings. 
they might be social media groupings. There might be uh, a group of people who are a fan of a certain media personality. It might be somebody who is uh, prominent in uh, any number of communities, you know, whether it's the knitting community or the feed the homeless community. You get somebody who cloaks him or herself in in a costume of community care and concern who then targets somebody else, somebody they don't like, often somebody who sees through them, somebody who actually has a righteous heart, that person has to be destroyed. So they make up all sorts of stories about how that actually righteous person has been abusing them, stealing from them, lying about them. You can basically count all the sins that the psychopath lists and you know that they are confessing and reciting what they are doing to that person they're targeting and they get all the hysterics. And when I say hysterics, I'm including people Absolutely people with borderline personality disorder, absolutely people with histrionic personality disorder, but also people who don't fall into the personality disorder category, but are heavy on those traits and may be suffering with complicated post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm talking about people like me, the person I used to be. That's how they get them. It's the whole thesis of this show. Come back after the break. Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio-only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform, so make sure you subscribe today. Looking for a non-woke place to put your money where your mouth is? Put it where my mouth is. Disaffected supporters get access to our private Discord chat server, backstage episode recording sessions, surprise guests, and more. And all it takes is $10 a month. You've got two options. Either Substack, visit us at disaffectedpod.substack.com, or go over to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Remember, choose the $10 level or higher for Discord access. California isn't stopping. We need to accept this. California is not going to stop. It's already out of line with the Constitution and sanity. It's already fully totalitarian. They simply haven't started the actual state-backed violence yet. Anyone who lives in that state should leave. I'm not being dramatic. I'm telling the truth. The state has already become a legal sanctuary for parents who want to abduct their children in custody battles to mutilate them through so-called gender-affirming care. It's legal to do that now in California, thanks to a recent law. And California will not allow its own courts to cooperate with courts outside the state to return that child if there's an extradition order. California will not allow its police to arrest a parent who has abducted a child on the grounds of gender-affirming care, even if there's a legitimate arrest warrant in another state. Again, this is in full, blatant violation of the United States Constitution, which no one, months later, is even mentioning in legal circles. California has already forced school districts to keep a child's alleged gender identity and pronouns a secret from parents. The state is punishing schools through the legal system who will not agree to hide a child's problems from their parents. And as of this week, the state has a new law that it will allow Calif- that will allow the state to take your children only on your children's say-so. This law got rid of the requirement that evidence of abuse had to be present before a child is is taken into what we euphemistically call residential care. Of course, California cloaks this 
under the claim that they're liberating kids so that kids can, in their words, consent to mental health care or residential care without their parents' knowledge, without their parents' consent and absent even an allegation of abuse, let alone evidence. This is Assembly Bill 665, which Governor Gavin Newsom signed into law on October 7th. I'll read to you from the preamble. Existing law for some purposes authorizes a minor who is 12 years of age or older to consent to mental health treatment or counseling on an outpatient basis or to residential services if the minor is mature enough to participate intelligently in the outpatient services or residential services, residential shelter services as specified, and either the minor would present a danger of serious physical harm or mental harm to themselves or others, or if the minor is the alleged victim of incest or child abuse. For other purposes, existing law authorizes a minor who is 12 years of age or older to consent to mental health treatment or counseling services if the minor is mature enough to participate intelligently in the outpatient services or counseling services. So now, now with a new law, any minor 12 years of age or older will be deemed mature enough to consent if what they're consenting to is surgery on their genitals or permanent poisoning by hormones. And kids in foster care are already more abused than almost any other cohort of children. This bill will make sure that the abuse leaves permanent scars and permanent physical disabilities. No, none of it's direct. This is all just preparing the grounds that they can do this. Don't believe them when they tell you that I'm exaggerating. I'm making stuff up that's not in the law. No, I'm not. From the bill, quote, this bill would align the existing laws by removing the additional requirement that in order to consent to mental health or counseling on an outpatient basis or to residential shelter services, the minor must present a danger of serious physical or mental harm to themselves or be the alleged victim of incest or child abuse. The key phrase there is removing the additional requirement. No more requirement for an allegation or evidence of abuse. It's simply on the child's say, the child's alleged say so. But we know who's ventriloquizing. No requirement that there be abuse, no requirement that the child is a danger to himself or others, just gets to do what he wants. So if he doesn't like his oppressive parents, he now belongs to the state of California under the law. Automatically, no investigation. What's there to investigate? The child is maturely consenting to being taken from his parents. Done. Dusted. More from the bill. Existing law for some purposes requires that the mental health treatment or counseling include involvement of the minor's parent or guardian unless the professional person treating or counseling the minor determines that that involvement would be inappropriate. For other purposes, existing law requires the involvement of the parent or guardian unless the professional person, etc., etc. But now, with the new law, quote, this bill would also align the existing laws by requiring the professional person treating or counseling the minor to consult with the minor before determining whether involvement of the minor's parent or guardian would be appropriate. So the child now has veto power over whether his parents are consulted. The state professional actually is the one who has veto power because that's what they want and that's what they now have. California families among the audience here for this show, I'm talking directly to you. This is real. This is what you are living under. Do you understand that this is actually real and that your children are in danger? Flee. Do it now. You know what Amber Alerts are, I assume. There are public service emergency messages sent out by cops and media when a child who is 17 or younger has been abducted. And the hope, of course, is to buzz people's cell phones and um, uh, grab motorists' attention with lighted signs on the side of the road that may help uh, identify that child and bring her home. But did you know that in California, they have an entire rainbow of options for alerts? For example, the feather alert. You think I'm making this up, don't you? Because my father was a pure Cherokee, or no, he married a pure Cherokee and my mother's people were ashamed of me. No, despite that, I'm still telling you the truth. <laughs> this is from the California Highway Patrol. I read to you and I show you on screen that I'm telling you the truth. Feather alert. 
<clears throat> the California statewide feather alert program was introduced through Assembly Bill 1314 and became law in 2022. A feather alert is a resource available to law enforcement agencies investigating the suspicious or unexplainable disappearance of an indigenous woman or indigenous person. The feather alert will provide immediate information to the public in order to aid in the swift recovery of missing indigenous persons. The feather alert goes out like this. <laughs> Don't get mad at me. Get mad at California. Who's being racist here? Feather alert. <laughs> you better have one for gay people like me. I want the fop alert. Oh my God. And, and did you notice, did you notice in this line, and you probably not, so I'm gonna go back and make sure that you notice it. Um, quote, a feather alert is a resource available to law enforcement agencies investigating the suspicious or unexplainable disappearance of an indigenous woman or indigenous person. Why was that necessary? Why did they need to say indigenous woman first? Are women not persons? No, it's, it's not actually that they don't think women are persons. Sorry, feminists. It's actually the opposite. They wanted their virtue points by saying indigenous woman. They wanted the phrase indigenous woman to hit you. That's what they wanted. Because we care about women, because women are more oppressed than anybody. <laughs> Language is full of tells. All right, so that's the feather alert. And if you're a swinging but missing senior, how about a silver alert? What is a silver alert? Yeah, the California Highway Patrol, I'm quoting from a lot. Yes, chips. It's chips that I'm quoting to you from. A silver alert is activated when an elderly, developmentally, or cognitively impaired person... <laughs> has gone missing and is determined to be at risk. Silver alerts provide immediate information to the public to aid in the swift recovery of at-risk persons meeting the criteria. So there are apparently many different ways to be silver, only one of which is to be old enough to have silver hair. You could also be developmentally impaired. <laughs> and now, new ebony alert. <laughs> From NBC News, it says, California's newly enacted ebony alert law is the first of its kind in the nation to prioritize the search for black youth gone missing. I think that's, his, is that Shelby on there? Thank you. What is an ebony alert, you ask? It's a special system designed to help locate missing black quote, youth. We'll get back to the definition of youth because we all know that missing black kids are never tracked and the media never feature them and the police refuse to look for them, even though that's totally not true and the number of Amber Alerts issued for black children is exactly proportional to the number of black children who go missing. Hat tip to Matt Walsh and his show for that information. These people lie, lie, lie. I'm not gonna read you the whole story that accompanied this, but it's full of lies. That, you know, Amber Alerts don't work for black kids. Nobody pays attention. Media never says anything. Well, Matt went and actually got the numbers and he found that the number of Amber Alerts for missing black kids was precisely percentage-wise proportional to the number of reported missing black kids, just as it was precisely proportional to the number of reported missing white kids. I, uh, how, how is anyone supposed to make, I'm answering my own question as I ask it. We're not actually supposed to make any decisions. We're not supposed to discern anything. That's not the point. The lies are the point. They want to lie us into not thinking. And, and they've been pretty successful. I'll quote to you from the story. <laughs> oh, my God. Data shows that uh, this, is, this is from Senator uh, Stephen Bradford, the Democrat and creator of the bill. Data shows that black and brown that black and brown are indigenous brothers and sisters when they go missing. 
There's very rarely the type of media attention, let alone Amber Alerts and police resources. Do you see the lie, folks? That we see with our white counterparts. State Senator Stephen Bradford told NBC News earlier this year. But it's more funny. It's more than funny. It's also grotesque. You see, if you're a plain old white kid and you're older than 17 years old, there's no Amber Alert for you. You've aged out. But if you're black in California, you get an alert under the Ebony Alerts all the way up to age 25. Think about that. Yeah, see what you're seeing on your screen. These are the requirements for Amber Alerts that applies to all kids, including white kids, compared to the uh, requirements for an Ebony Alert. I'll read to you the Amber Alert requirements. Kids must be no older than 17. There must be evidence of an abduction. Police must have a belief of imminent danger or harm to the child, and runaways don't qualify for an Amber Alert. But with an Ebony Alert, black people up to 25 years old are eligible. There's no requirement for evidence of an abduction, not even a claim of abduction. Um, the disappearance must only be unexplained, meaning if somebody decided to run away and not call his parents, um, that, that's eligible. Uh, and there's no requirement for imminent danger. So we are to believe that a 24-year-old black man is a youth who is at risk. And he deserves all of these resources that no other race deserves. This is naked racism. The left are the racists. Is this clear yet? Don't tell me white people can't be aggressed against in a racial way. Don't tell me there's no such thing as racism against white people. It's the fucking policy of half this country. And I'm still hearing people say this shit like it's not real. Mm. Illinois school bathrooms. <laughs> There's a public school superintendent in Illinois who was very, very angry that students don't like the fact that their trans inclusive policy on bathrooms has driven sane students to refuse to use those bathrooms. And he intends to punish those students. This is from the Daily Wire. Headline, school investigates students who chose to use private bathroom for implicit harassment of transgenders. <laughs> from the story, after an Illinois school implemented a policy that allowed students who said they were transgender to use the bathroom of their choice, it said non-transgender students who were uncomfortable with the decision could opt to use the bathroom in the nurse's office. What the school failed to anticipate was that so many students took it up, took them up on the offer that the line for the nurse's bathroom began forming down the hall. The miscalculation caused the superintendent to say the students were, quote, harassing the transgender students by opting for the private bathroom, according to reports obtained by parents defending education and shared first with the Daily Wire. Got that? You got that? If you don't want to stand next to me, you're harassing me. If you don't want to disrobe in front of me, you're harassing me. This is a particularly grotesque form of forced teaming. You know, another concept we've forgotten from our Constitution, we just, it's just not operational anymore, freedom of association. Freedom to associate includes the freedom not to associate with. <laughs> Excuse me. From the story, quote, when biologically male high school students came forward and stated they were uncomfortable with biological female students using male restrooms, we told those students they could use the nurse's restroom. Waterloo Community Unit School District Number 5 Superintendent Brian Charon wrote to parents on March 17th. Quote, it was an effort to support those students' comfort, but unfortunately it resulted in a disruption, end quote. No, your policy caused disruption. Your policy disrupted the privacy and dignity of boys and girls by forcing them to undress at least partially in front of the opposite sex in an intimate space where they are defecating or urinating. You are very, very angry that the children are not doing as you say and you're gonna punish them. Quote, this line grew dramatically throughout the day with 
male and female students filling the hallway and causing students to be tardy to or miss classes. These actions were not the appropriate way to send a message to the school district. We are investigating this behavior as planned harassment of transgender students, he wrote. This is the superintendent, Brian Charon. Yeah. There is no appropriate way to send that message. That message is not allowed. Everyone knows it. You know it listening and watching. Everyone on that school board knows it. Brian Charon knows it. Brian Charon is simply a liar, like all of them. They're going to plan her not using the bathroom. <laughs> Not using the bathroom and actually availing yourself of the bathroom that the school's own policy in writing says you are entitled to do if you're uncomfortable is an act of harassment. Welcome to Cluster B. Welcome to my mother's ever-changing rules that were different at 7 p.m. than they were at 4 p.m. Welcome to Cluster B. May I take your order? Back to the story. Some students were already punished by being marked tardy or absent for waiting in the bathroom stall, Mr. Charon wrote. Students who attempt to repeat today's actions will be disciplined for attempting to cause a disruption in the school, the letter said. Days before Superintendent Charon's letter, the school board had passed a policy that said transgender students could use the wrong restroom as long as the student developed a, quote, gender identity plan, end quote, with school districts, with, with school officials. So another acronym, we've got IEPs, which are individual education plans. Now we've got GIPs, which are gender identity plans. <laughs> Scour that guy's laptop, investigate him, fire him actually, fire him now, fire that guy. Parents descend on the school board, shout, scream, refuse to leave, demand that he is fired, demand that that policy be, re be rescinded. This is your duty, do it now. And we're going to take you out here with a musical interlude. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Marianne Williamson Feminist Orchestra. Hi, we're Copper Women, and we support Marianne Williamson for president because it's time we have a mother in the White House who supports a guaranteed livable wage. And who supports universal health care. Trans rights tuition-free college who will declare a climate emergency and work to transition to a peace economy. We Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform, so make sure you subscribe today. Looking for a non woke place to put your money where your mouth is? Put it where my mouth is. Disaffected supporters get access to our private Discord chat server, backstage episode recording sessions, surprise guests, and more. And all it takes is $10 a month. You've got two options. Either Substack, visit us at disaffectedpod.substack.com, or go over to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Remember, choose the $10 level or higher for Discord access. like disaffected? Do you get value out of this? Do you find things here you won't find anywhere else? The answer is yes. Can we have your support, please? It takes money to produce this show and we could definitely use some of it. There's a couple of ways to support us. You can visit our Substack. It's probably the best front door right now. Disaffectedpod.substack.com. And when you buy a paid subscription there, 
You're not only supporting the show, but you're getting access to the uh, premium articles uh, that we write up for members only. You also get access to our private Discord chat. It's a, a chat server. Uh, with lots of different topic channels. There's about 400 people in there who are already supporting the show. There's conversation happening at any time of day and night on multiple different topics. And Kevin and I pop in there from time to time. So again, disaffectedpod.substack.com. Your other option to support us is through Subscribestar. And just visit us at subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Now, to close out the show, we have an update on a story from last week on the murder of Philadelphia social justice activist Josh Kruger. We told you about how he was, uh, he was a gay progressive activist and he was gunned down in his apartment building. Here's a picture of him on your screen. We told you about how Josh Kruger mocked people who were concerned with crime in his city of Philadelphia. He said that they were right-wing nuts. He said that crime was not a problem in his city. He said that COVID was more dangerous than crime and he characterized everyone who disagreed with him as just stupid racists. And then he was murdered in his own apartment building. Well, more details have come out this week. More details will come out in the future. We cannot confirm for you whether all of these details we're going to share with you are absolutely true. None of this has been proven in a court of law. It is subject to change. We have an arrest suspect named Robert Davis, an 18-year-old black man. He is the one who is alleged to have gunned down Josh Kruger. I'm going to read to you from the New York Daily News. Family of the 19-year-old suspect, uh, he was 19, I said 18, excuse me. Family of the 19-year-old suspect accused of killing Philadelphia journalist Josh Kruger has alleged that the duo, that is Josh and... Um, Robert Davis, it's alleged that the duo had been in a drug-fueled relationship and that the teen was being blackmailed with explicit videos. Robert Davis is wanted for fatally shooting Kruger inside his two-story townhouse on the 2300 block of Watkins Street in Point Breeze, Philadelphia. Police said the 39-year-old journalist was shot seven times in the chest and abdomen on October 2nd, at around 1.30 a.m. Afterward, he staggered from his home in search of help before collapsing on the street where he was found. Seven shots usually indicates a personal involvement. That doesn't sound like a random execution. That sounds more like personal anger. Back to the story. Kruger, who was later pronounced dead at an area hospital, was remembered as an LGBTQ writer and activist who used his own experience with homelessness, sex work, and drug addiction to inspire others. Unfortunate phrasing. Quote, Police previously said they believed Kruger, 39, was trying to help Davis, but the teen's family has since contested that narrative. In a recent interview with the Philadelphia Inquirer, his brother and mother alleged that Kruger was engaged in a sexual relationship with Davis, who was just 15 years old when they started seeing each other. Josh Kruger was in his 30s when this alleged relationship began with a 15-year-old. Next quote, Davis's mother, Demika Davis, said her son called last Friday, just hours after Philadelphia police showed up at her home in search of her son. During the call, she claims he confirmed the person he'd been seeing was Kruger, who worked for the city, including the Office of Homeless Services from 2015 to 2020. His family further claims Kruger threatened to post sexually explicit videos of Davis online prior to the shooting. There are some interesting tweets from Mr. Josh Kruger that have come to light. I'll share them with you. First one, he says, when I was 14, I was sexually abused by an adult. It was confusing to me. I thought I acted in a way that I deserved it and that it should be okay. Next tweet. The insidious part of sexual abuse of young males is that as males, we're taught 
We can't be abused, and we must like it. This is not true. Final tweet. It took me 10 plus years to realize my distrust of people, men in particular, and my overall terror were partly a result of being sexually abused. This is, this is the tragic cycle of abuse. Hand it down to the next generation and repeat and repeat and repeat. Round and round and round. Looks different, doesn't it, than how it was presented at first. A lot of things look different when you go beneath the headlines. A lot of people who you are assured are morally pure turn out not to be morally pure. A lot of things that are presented to you, to me, to all of us, as evidence of racism, homophobia, queerphobia, misogyny, are no such thing. And a lot of the people that we are told are secular saints are not saints, and a lot of the people that we are told are evil are not in fact evil at all. Meanwhile in black news, liberal columnist Juan Williams, formerly of Fox News, has some surprising information for us about President Joe Biden. This is from uh, Juan Williams's opinion column in The Hill this week titled, Joe Biden is our third black president. <laughs> if Joe Biden can be black, why can't Rachel Dolezal? I'm serious. <laughs> make it make sense, mother. <laughs> From Juan Williams, quote, 25 years ago, novelist Toni Morrison famously labeled Bill Clinton as, quote, the first black president. <laughs> the first actual black president, Barack Obama, would come later. Oh, and by the way, this whole thing, everybody is capital B black, of course. Back to it. But Morrison's memorable one-liner still gets laps. It was a smart way to say that Clinton broke new ground by elevating black leaders and policies that helped black people. Mm. By Morrison's standard, President Joe Biden is our nation's third black president. Spicy ethnic. So, so what is it that makes Joe our third black president? Well, it's because of the wonderful things he does. Quote, Biden has achieved the lowest black unemployment rate on record. He lowered the cost of prescription drugs and hearing aids. He has the fastest rate of creation of black-owned small businesses in the past 25 years. He can point to an increase in black enrollment in government-sponsored health care plans and a double-digit reduction in black child poverty. Really? Oh, I super believe that. I super believe that just the way I super believe that the economy is doing better than ever, that Joe Biden created more new jobs than any other president, even though we can all see that nobody is working. <laughs> it's not that there aren't jobs out there. It's that people aren't working. Somehow they're still able to pay their bills. How is that happening? I think it's government benefits. <laughs> but remember. If you capitalize the B in the word black, that makes you a good person. <laughs> ah, laugh, cry, laugh, cry, laugh, cry. All right. Since we're light on all things trans this week, um, I thought I'd give you this. Um, this is apparent psychopath Candy Cottager, Jeffrey Marsh, decompensating and spinning out as he realizes that his joyride may be coming to a cultural end. Schools in the UK are warning parents about Geoffrey Marsh. And this is something I absolutely welcome because his influence is spreading worldwide. And I believe that Geoffrey Marsh is one of the most dangerous and evil people. I wish you peace. 
I really do. Um, one of the beautiful things about being trans is that it has taught me perseverance and hating your way through life is not a recipe for perseverance. And it's also not what you as a human being deserve. And that addiction to hate, you know, you, it feels really good to hate me. And then that craving starts again. It doesn't actually hit the mark. I wish you detox. I truly do wish you peace. I wish you peace. I really do. Now put the fucking lotion in the basket. <laughs> Most of the audience for this show is already on side with most of the positions that we take. I know this. This is how shows work. But if there are any progressive Democrats or liberals who are listening, this is what I would say to them. The chickens are coming home to roost. All the things that conservatives told you would happen are now happening. Now, they're happening to you and to yours, the people you care about. We tried to tell you years ago that we could see the end of this train track. We could see the actual destination. How could we see it? Because we were looking. We were looking down the train track. We could see it. You could have seen it too, but you refused to look with us. You went like this. Nope, I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look. You're lying. You told us that we were radicalized by kooky right-wing ideas. You said that we exaggerated. You said that we were hysterical. But now you are experiencing those things personally. It's happening to you personally, not to the imaginary fantasy victim you've been using in your head as a mental stand-in for yourself. It's harder to deny when it actually touches people you love, isn't it? I know. Good. Will you reconsider? Are you willing to contemplate that we might not have been crazy? Can you accept that we were not telling you these things because we were bigots or because we had hate in our hearts, but because we genuinely believed them and because they were true? Time is short. See you next week.